I don't feel no ways tired. I come too far from where I started from. Nobody told me that the road would be easy. I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me. How's everybody doing? My name is Anthony Brian Logan, and today we're going to talk about this study that apparently comes from Yale. And you see the headline right next to me, right over my shoulder. It says, White liberals present themselves as less competent in interactions with African Americans. Now, this is not anything new to me. This is something that I would see a lot towards the end of being a liberal. Because once you start to have life experiences, get older and get out there in the world, you see things differently. When you're a child, you see things kind of through rose tinted goggles. And everybody's all equal. We all should have money and all this, that, and the third. But then once you start to get older, you begin to realize what's really happening. Uh, the reality of the world sets in. And then as that starts to happen, I will see these types of things go on. And I got caught on it myself for doing it because quiet is kept. This is not just a thing that affects the white liberal. It's a thing that affects liberals in general. Back when I was a liberal, I would do the same thing to, you know, hood people or whatever. I'm thinking, okay, because you come from the hood, because you did not grow up the same way I grew up, then you must be uh, of less intelligence. You must not be able to understand certain words that I'll say. And one of my good friends, shout out to you, you know, who you are, it, you know, I did that to him. He was like, Hey man, don't do that. It's because you think that I'm just that in the third. Doesn't mean I can't understand what you're saying. We're friends. I can understand you. And that kind of was like little, little things like that would happen as I got older that led me down the road of not being on the left anymore. But a lot of people are still in the 30s and 40s that don't get it. We're going to get into this article to see exactly what's going on here, to see exactly what it says. And the article reads, racial bias can put people of color. And I hate that term, <laughs> people of color. But then again, we are on Yale, so it is what it is. Let's just rock with it for now to get through the article. Racial bias can put people of color at a disadvantage when interviewing for a job, buying a house or interacting with the police. Uh, not really. I don't think that's true. You know, uh, buying a house, interacting with the police. I've never had any bad interactions with the police. Most people don't. Most people, the only time they even talk to the police is for a traffic violation or you were speeding uh, your headlights out or you happen to come across a checkpoint where they stop everybody to see what's going on. That is pretty much the average person's interaction with the police. Unless you're out there committing crime or you live in a very uh, high crime neighborhood, it's going to be a little bit different. But your interactions may be different. That doesn't mean that it's going to be bad. But let's keep going with the article. New research suggests that bias may also shape daily interactions between racial minorities and white people, even those whites who tend to be less biased. According to new research by Sidney Dupree, assistant professor of organizational behavior at Yale School of Medicine, if I'm not mistaken, I don't really know for wrong. Let me know in the comments. White liberals tend to downplay their own verbal competence in exchanges with racial minorities compared to how other white Americans act in such exchanges. The study is scheduled for publication in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. This is very interesting. They don't talk about white conservatives here. They just say white liberals tend to do it, but others don't, basically. You know, because it says compared to how other white Americans, that means conservatives or people that are kind of agnostic politically. So we see from this here that white liberals are more racist in this particular context than everybody else. But let's keep going with the article. While many previous studies have examined how people who hold racial bias behave in multiracial settings, few have studied how whites who are more well-intentioned interact with people of other races. Quote, there's less work that explores how well-intentioned whites try to get along with racial minorities. Dupree says, we want to know their strategies for increasing connections between members of social, of different social groups and how effective these strategies are. All you got to do is just be yourself. There's no need for you to downplay your intelligence or anything like that. If you speak in common language, then do that. 
there's no reason for anybody going around speaking like Michael Eric Dyson using thousand dollar words. People don't talk like that normally. They're talking very basic language, especially nowadays when you got your cell phones or whatnot. People are speaking in emojis and LOLs and BYBs and OTWs and stuff like that. But I digress. Let's keep going. And here's a study right here. And of course, this article will be in the description box below if you want to check it out for yourself rather than just listen to me uh, blabber about it. But let's keep rocking. Dupree and her co-author, Susan Fisk of Princeton University began by analyzing the words using campaign speeches delivered by Democratic and Republican presidential candidates to different audiences over the years. <laughs> Let's pause for a moment right here. Remember that whole thing from Joe Biden? They going to put y'all back in chains. And uh, Hillary Clinton, I am by no ways tired. Did any Republican ever do that? I, I mean, maybe they did like 100 years ago, but did you see anybody do that in a 2016 campaign cycle? I don't know, but if I'm wrong, let me know in the comments below. I'd love to hear it, but let's keep rocking. They scanned 74 speeches delivered by white candidates over a 25 year period. Approximately half were addressed to mostly minority audiences at a Hispanic small business roundtable discussion or a black church, for example. They even paired each speech delivered to mostly minority audience with a comparable speech deliver at a mostly white audience at a mostly white church or university. For example, the researchers analyzed sex of these speeches for two measures, words related to competence. That is words about ability or status, such as assertive or competitive and words related to warmth. That is words about friendliness, such as supportive and compassionate. <laughs> I know where this is going because in a lot of these speeches that they give to the so-called minorities, it'd be things about safe spaces and, you know, uh, you know, people of color and, all, you know, just really kind of kind of girly language, you know, and that's OK to have girly language. But that's not really a thing that you do to groups of people that include men and women and people that aren't children anymore. But let's keep rocking. Warmth related to intentions towards others and competence related to the ability to carry out those intentions are two fundamental dimensions of how we see others and portray ourselves in social interactions. Stereotypical portrayals of black Americans generally show them as being less competent than their white counterparts, but not necessarily less friendly or warm to pre explains the team found that democratic candidates use fewer competence related words in speeches delivered to mostly minority audiences than they did in speeches delivered to mostly white audiences. Very interesting. The difference wasn't statistically significant in speeches by Republican candidates, though it was harder to find speeches from Republicans delivered to minority audiences to pre notes. I mean, that's going to be normal because we're not really welcome. When I say we, I mean, those of us that vote Republican or who happen to be Republican, we're not really invited into these kind of spaces. We're not really welcome there. So that's just what that is. But let's keep rocking. Because I know I see what they did there. That was kind of a dog whistle. It's like, well, they're not really going to be at these places anyway. And Democrats go. So so what? That's kind of what I saw. But let's keep rocking. There was no difference in Democrats or Republicans uses of words related to warmth. It was really surprising to see that for nearly three decades, Democratic presidential candidates have been engaging in this predicted behavior. Why is it shocking? Why is it surprising? I mean, this is this is just part for the course. But let's keep going. With this preliminary evidence in hand, the researchers set out to further test their ideas. They designed a series of experiments in which white participants were asked to respond to a hypothetical or presumed real interaction partner. For half of these participants, their partner was given a stereotypically white name such as Emily. <laughs> For the other half, their partner was given a stereotypically black name such as Lakeisha. Participants were asked to select from a list of words for an email to their partner. For some studies, the email was work related task. For others, this email was simply to introduce themselves. Each word had been previously scored on how warm or competent it appears. The word sad, for example, scored low for both warmth and competence. Melancholy, on the other hand, scored high for competence and low on warmth on low on warmth. Participant also completed a variety of measures that assess how liberal they were. Now, sad. I mean, OK, did they have to use the word sad or melancholy? People are going to use the word sad. Normally, that's a very common word. Melancholy. That's not a commonly used word. 
If I'm wrong, let me know, but that's not really something that you hear a lot commonly used. The researchers found that liberal individuals were less likely to use words that would make them appear highly competent when the person they were addressing was presumed to be black rather than white. No significant differences were seen in the word selection of conservatives based on the presumed race of their partner. It was kind of an unpleasant surprise to see this subtle but persistent effect, Dupree says. Even if it's ultimately well-intentioned, it could be seen as patronizing. Now, what's well-intentioned about using less, uh, you know, quote-unquote intensive words to talk to somebody? And beyond that, let's go back to this whole thing about sad versus melancholy. You, you're going to use the word sad mostly regardless of who you're talking to. That's a normal word you use regardless of who you're talking to, whites, blacks. Anybody is going to be a normal word. You use a more complex word when you're trying to impress somebody. So you're trying to impress the white person, but not the black person. Maybe I'm just saying that's just kind of what I'm thinking. That's my line of thought right now. But let's keep rocking. Dupree and Fist suspect that the behavior stems from a liberal person's desire to connect with other races. One possible reason for the competence downshift, as the authors describe it, is that regardless of race, people tend to downplay their competence when they want to appear likable and friendly. But it's also possible that this is happening because people are using common stereotypes in an effort to get along. That's correct. They think that black people are less intelligent, so they're going to connect with us on that level. Like I said from the beginning, I'm not proud to say it, but back when I was a liberal, I would look at people that came from the hood or people that grew up with less, quote unquote, privilege. I'm going to say I grew up privileged. I grew up in areas that weren't as poor as the ghetto, but <laughs> it was still like all black poor. But anyway, I would talk in less complex language because I felt like they couldn't understand me if I spoke in more complex language. That's what the white liberals do to you if you are not white most of the time. That's what it is. It's not about trying to communicate and be friendly. It's about trying to communicate on their level because they're not as smart as you are. But let's keep going. Initial data from follow-up studies suggest that describing the black person as highly intelligent, thus reversing the stereotype, or as highly motivated to get along with the whites, thus removing the need to prove goodwill, can reduce the likelihood that a white person will downplay their competence in their interaction with the black person. So basically, um, if the black person is very intelligent and the person can sense that, that they can judge you as being very intelligent, or if they're going out of their way to get along with the white person, I guess is what they're saying. I'm not really sure how you're going to quantify that, but I digress. If that's happening, then uh, the white person will feel more comfortable and talk to them in the way that they will normally speak. I don't really know. But we continue. Now, Dupree is working to understand how these behaviors play out in real world organizations. For example, where the medical professionals engage in this behavior when interacting with minority patients and how corporate executives present themselves to minority peers. She is also testing the efficacy of this possibly strategic behavior. For example, do black receivers of white liberals competence downshift see this behavior as demeaning or endearing? There's a lot of research focused on biased individuals and how holding bias, especially implicit bias, can influence social interactions, the pre says, but that leaves a lot of people out. My hope is that this work will help include well-intentioned people who see themselves as allies. <laughs> this language is really triggering me because I'm hearing a lot of dog whistles. I'm like going off the chain. But who may be unwittingly contributing to group divides. There is a broader need to include them in the conversation. That, that was kind of a convoluted conclusion. But I mean, I get it. I understand what's going on. What's happening here is very simple. You have these white liberals that talk about how, quote unquote, racist conservatives are they're talking to black people in a way that is to appeal to a lower level of competence they think that we have this is not a new thing like i said before i was seeing it a lot in interactions with myself and white liberals as i got older i did it when i was very young a little liberal this is a big part of the reason why i left the left it's not anything new here. I'm just glad that people are starting to wake up and see it. You're seeing studies from Yale and other places. Obviously, these people that wrote this study aren't quite there yet. They're using a lot of key phrases. It lets me know that they're not really trying to support anything conservative by a long shot. 
but at least they're starting to see certain kinks in the white liberal armor, which had been proven to be bulletproof for a very long time, in my humble opinion. So that's pretty much all I got to say. What say you? Do you think it's racist to talk down to somebody because of their skin color? You see a black person, you automatically assume, oh, they don't know that word. They don't know this word. They can't go to the DMV and get an ID to go vote. They can't go and get health insurance on themselves. They can't go get a job. So they got to raise minimum wage. Is that racist to think that way? Is it okay to think that way? If it's not racist, then how can these same liberals talk about how racist the other side is when, according to this study, the other side does not do what they do? I mean... It's a pretty interesting conversation, but whatever your comments are, please let me know in the comments below. And that's all I got to say for this video. If you like what you heard, please comment, rate, share, and subscribe. Peace.